we have to create some form agreed upon version of AI for good or AI that benefits humanity. If we do regulate AI, if we do continue to regulate a lot of these bioengineering and the advancements in both of those spaces, that eventually someone else who wasn't dealing with that regulation is going to outpace us and is going to use that technology for bad. Or that if a government comes in and says, we want to see this happen, the government that is democratic decides to really pour funding into it and you start seeing people come together and collaborating across industries and across countries, then you start seeing massive impact. Hi everyone, my name is Milan Kordestani and I'm excited to share that I have a new book, Moonshot Moments. Something that I talk about in this book that I feel is very important is that the proliferation of AI can either create great wealth and great surplus and surplus of time and money and resources for humanity, or it can do the opposite and it can totally tear apart our society and leave people aimless, jobless, lacking some forms of spirituality, lacking forms of income. The reality is at this point in time, it's kind of in our hands as humanity on which way we try to guide AI. And what I advocate for in the book and what I've learned from all these other authors and these other theoreticians is that we have to create some form of agreed upon version of good AI or AI for good or AI that benefits humanity and ideally creating some sort of regulatory body that is not just within one country but across countries that ends up meaning that we are not creating technology that's going to be super painful for humanity, that is easy to be used for cyber attacks, to commit fraud. At the end of the day, those things are going to be created and we have to try to prevent against those. But that's part of what I'm advocating for, is that we have to start working on these solutions sooner because the alternative that can be created, if it outpaces the progress, it ends up being some form of an extinction level event for our species. While my book is quite optimistic on how we can prevent that extinction level event from happening, that is what all these other books are saying is going to happen. That is what Yuval Noah Harari says in Nexus is going to happen. And he's the most prominent writer of, of history right now. He's one of the most prominent historians in his most recent book where he outlines from the Stone Ages up until now and, and how technology has impacted human evolution. That's what he's pointing to, is that we're going to end up reaching a point where there are so many cyber attacks and there is so much pain being inflicted on society, whether it's from bioengineering or cyber attacks, that it's just going to be become a quite unlivable world. What I'm advocating for, and especially in this book, is targeting kind of the younger generation to really think about the solutions and the preventative measures that we can take. And truly, it ends up becoming this kind of idealistic, kind of utopian sounding message that we need to kind of come together as a species across nations to regulate, prevent that disruption from happening. Can regulation actually cause the downfall? If we do regulate AI, if we do continue to regulate a lot of these bioengineering and the advancements in both of those, those spaces, that eventually someone else is going to have, who wasn't dealing with that regulation, is going to outpace us and is going to use that technology for bad, or that the government itself will be able to say, well, we need to surveil people and that we need to be involved in the development of new technologies. There's good and bad to that. To some extent, we do want the government to be involved in the evolution of some of these technologies that are kind of species-wide upsetting in some ways. They upset our normal ways of life. But in other ways, yeah, if we have a government that is authoritarian, that isn't democratic, then that's when it becomes most concerning. So when you get governments involved, what ends up happening is you end up getting these otherwise siloed groups, these siloed factions that are working on similar but taking different approaches to new technologies being created. They actually end up becoming much more collaborative. That if a government comes in and says, we want to see this happen, then all of a sudden you start seeing academics and the private sector come together to make progress much faster. That's what I advocate for. Those moments in time, those are those moonshot moments where all of a sudden, because the government that is democratic decides to really pour funding into it and you start seeing people come together and collaborating across industries and across countries, then you start seeing massive impact. One example was the creation of the internet. We decided that once we created the internet, which was heavily and still is heavily owned and operated by the government, we needed to make it accessible for people. And same thing for communication. And so 
we started working with other nations to literally create lines of cable that go underneath the ocean between countries for people to be able to communicate and send information from one place to another. That's one moonshot moment where it was like, okay, we agree as a species that we need to be able to communicate with one another. So we're going to create lines that go underneath the ocean and go from country to country, connecting us and bringing us all online. I mean, you've seen the opposite of that, I think, in past administrations, for example. I mean, this is a divisive topic, but like someone like Elon Musk, who is building a lot of these really society upsetting technologies uh, like Neuralink or like Starlink, where they're, he's trying to create a web that satellites across the planet. They require some level of collaboration from the government and that if you don't have a government that's in line with a lot of these innovators or isn't supportive of these innovators or creating some sort of playground for them to operate within, then it becomes really divisive and then you start seeing that the opposite starts to arise. Do we lose something within the larger human community by choosing to erase abnormalities in the genetic code? So when we are able and it's legal to do genetic engineering, is there a chance that we end up losing things? Um, and that's one of the main arguments of people who are against transhumanism. And so in that question of will we lose something when transhumanists find a solution to the suite of experiences we classify as neurodivergence, for example, such as autism, OCD, ADHD, and more. What if we limit neurodiversity among our species? Well, there's a chance then that we lose our Salvador Dali, our Steve Jobses, our Isaac Newtons, or Michelangelos. We've lost our Darwins and Teslas and Einsteins. And suddenly those moonshot moments seem to slip further from our grasp. So I write about that in this book because it's one of the important philosophical questions to think about, which is that when we get to a point where we're able to genetically engineer so many of these things that we consider problematic in our society or in our human DNA away, do we end up losing those people who are on the fringes and able to accomplish so much, are able to accomplish such great leaps of progress for our species, such evolutionary-like moments, which again I call moonshot moments? <laughs>